going to be talking a little bit today about the impetus project and just giving you an overview of some of the science questions um, that we're kind of interested in and, and a hint, uh, one or two of the preliminary results. Okay, so yeah, so impetus is all about um, thinking about forecasting drought and water scarcity in the UK. Um, again, with the, the idea of kind of supporting decision making. Um, so, yeah, so the key thing here is, is thinking about uh, improving predictions of UK drought and, and thinking about uh, improving forecasts on the time scales of months to decades. So uh, really trying to push out the kind of the horizon on which we might be able to say something useful about future drought. Um, as well as thinking about uh, kind of the, I guess the, the meteorological and hydrological drivers of drought, um, we're also thinking a little bit about the drivers of water demand. Um, and as I said before, you know, the, the idea here is to think about this you know, within the context of supporting decision making. Okay, and um, I mean, it's been mentioned the, this morning before a couple of times, um, but you know, droughts are really multifaceted um, phenomena. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm a meteorologist, so I, I, it'd be nice if we could just stop at the deficit of rainfall. But I think um, we have to, you know, in reality, you know, droughts are really a, a complex process. So we have to think not only about the meteorological drought, but also about the hydrological components, so agricultural drought, um, then surface and groundwater drought, uh, as well as just you know, thinking about the rainfall. So to deal with this, this multifaceted um, aspect and interdisciplinary aspect of drought, um, we need an interdisciplinary team. So these are the people who are involved in impetus. Um, so from the um, meteorological aspect, there's ourselves uh, at the National Centre for Atmospheric Science, based at Reading. Um, there's also uh, Oxford, uh, physics at Oxford, and uh, Newcastle involved in thinking about seasonal forecasting from a meteorological perspective. The, uh, the hydrological aspects have been um, addressed by CEH, so the Centre for Ecology and Hydrology, uh, and BGS, so the British Geological Survey. Um, the water demand modelling uh, is being uh, investigated by Ben Anderson down in Southampton. And then um, there's also a question about, um, well, I, guess, I guess, stakeholder engagement, but also even if we created the perfect forecast, would people use it? Um, so there's a social science aspect as well, and that's, that's been addressed by uh, INSYS here in Oxford and uh, by the Walker Institute at Reading. And also we have uh, a range of project partners, um, in particular... We have uh, the, the two um, operational meteorological forecasting centres who are based in the UK, so the Met Office and uh, the European Centre for Medium Range Weather Forecasts, um, and then a range of other kind of stakeholders, including a couple of uh, water companies. Okay, so here's a kind of a schematic about, well, how, how would you actually go about producing a forecast of drought? So I guess we kind of think about drought existing within, you know, the kind of this, this region here around water resources and the hydrological systems. Um, uh, and obviously, there's memory in the hydrological systems. Um, you know, it, it takes a while for a, a, an aquifer to dry out. It takes a while for river flows to become low. Um, so we can use uh, the memory in the hydrological system as a way of thinking about monitoring drought or early warning of drought. Um, but also, we want to think about the water demand aspect. So how much, um, how much is water demand changing under drought conditions? Um, is, that, is that mitigating are drought conditions, is it, is it acting to enhance drought conditions? And I guess finally, if we're thinking about um, pushing out the boundaries or the horizons on which we want to say something useful about droughts, um, then we also have to think about the meteorological aspect. So is there any predictability in the, in the climate system, so in the atmosphere and in the oceans, that might actually give us some uh, predictability for thinking about drought conditions in the UK? So I'm going to turn, first of all, to thinking about seasonal forecasts from the meteorological conditions, because this is probably the part for the UK which is um, where you know, we're trying to make the most progress. So um, if we're going to think about drought in the UK and the meteorological conditions that are conducive for drought in the UK, then we need to stop thinking on a slightly larger scale. Um, in particular, we need to think about the atmospheric circulation patterns that give rise to s rainfall deficits over the UK. So I'm going to talk a little bit about something that some people may be familiar with, but some may not. Um, so this is a large-scale circulation pattern called the North Atlantic Oscillation. Um, and basically, over the, over the North Atlantic, we've got um, low pressures um, kind of around Iceland, and then high pressures uh, down in the subtropics, the Azores high. And that surface pressure gradient, um, or in between the surface pressure gradient, we have the, the North Atlantic jet stream. Um, and the North Atlantic jet stream steers storms um, into 
the UK and into Europe. And that's in the winter time, that's largely where we get a lot of our precipitation from, is from you know, storms coming in off the North Atlantic. So the North Atlantic Oscillation really describes the variations in the strength of the North Atlantic jet stream. Um, and the way that we typically describe this is that for uh, a North Atlantic Oscillation positive uh, pattern, we tend to have a stronger jet stream, more storms being brought in, and then kind of wet conditions over the, over the UK and over Europe. And North Atlantic uh, negative is the opposite, so we have a weak surface pressure gradient, we have a weaker storm track, uh, so weaker, weaker uh, jet stream, and less storms have been brought into, into the UK, and, and, and correspondingly we have uh, dry conditions. So one question is, how predictable is the North Atlantic Oscillation on uh, seasonal timescales? So thinking, say, um, maybe a month to three months ahead. And I think um, maybe um, a couple of years ago, I think we would have said that the the scale, the predictable scale in the North Atlantic Oscillation uh, uh, for winter time and a couple of months ahead was, was pretty limited, close to zero. Um, so there's been recent results um, sort of reassessing that, so improving the seasonal forecasting systems and reassessing the predictability. Um, and here's a figure from uh, a paper by Edna Scaife from the Met Office showing the latest results from the, uh, the, the Met Office's latest seasonal forecasting system known as Glossy 5. So the the time series here is the North Atlantic Oscillation. So it's just this measure of the pressure gradient. And when this is positive, then we have um, a stronger jet stream and more storms coming into the UK. When it's negative, we have um, a weaker pressure gradient and less storms. Um, and this is the observed time series here. Um, you can kind of pick up maybe one or two events here. So this is 2010, which, if you might remember, was very cold and dry in the UK in wintertime. And then the orange line is the forecasts from the uh, Glossy 5 system. So the way that these forecasts are done is that um, the Met Office take their climate model uh, and they initialize the climate model with um, information about the current state of the climate system, so how warm the oceans are, where the sea ice edges, etc. And then they run forward their climate system, uh, their climate model to actually produce a forecast. And they do that multiple times, so it's, a, it's an ensemble forecast, so they're producing probabilistic information. So each of these orange dots uh, is one of these forecasts, and the orange line here is the, is the ensemble mean. So they just average all those individual forecasts together. And you can see, if you kind of look at this, this time series, that there are, there are times when the, the forecast system is doing quite well in terms of capturing the observed evolution of the North Atlantic Oscillation. So in particular, kind of um, at the end of the 1990s, uh, and then this very recent period where there was these large swings in the North Atlantic Oscillation, the forecast system is doing quite a good job at capturing... Um, the evolution of the North Atlantic Oscillation. So the correlation here is about 0.62. So we've kind of gone from having very little scale in forecasting the North Atlantic Oscillation to having some modest scale in forecasting the North Atlantic Oscillation. So that's very nice. Um, but of course, if we're thinking about drought, then we need to ask the question, well, if we're able to capture some of the, or forecast some of the aspects of the, uh, s on a seasonal time scale, in terms of these large-scale atmospheric circulation patterns, how does that translate into scale uh, for some, you know, some more relevant variables such as temperature and rainfall over the UK? And the answer is if you take the rainfall from that forecast system and look at it directly, then you don't get a lot of uh, very skillful forecasts. But what we've uh, been trying to do in impetus is use some of the um, information about the North Atlantic Oscillation um, and what we know about how that affects conditions over the UK to kind of basically downscale um, our forecasts. So there's a, an observed relationship between the North Atlantic Oscillation and UK precipitation and rainfall. So there's a couple of scatter plots here just indicating that you know, there's, there's kind of a linear relationship when the North Atlantic Oscillation is strongly positive, then we tend to have high temperatures and high precipitation in the UK. And we can use that information to downscale the, uh, the forecast to try and recover some scale uh, from the, uh, the, the dynamical forecast system. So um, these time series here, the... the Blue line is the observed precipitation anomalies over the UK. Um, the red line is what we get directly from the dynamical system. So just this thing here. And, it, and it's got a very low, uh, the dynamical system has a very low skill for precipitation over the UK. So the correlation is about 0.41. But if we just use that linear relationship between North Atlantic Oscillation and precipitation, then we can recover a fair amount of that skill. So the, the uh, so it's the purple line, it's maybe not that clear. But you can sort of see that we can capture some of these large... The, the, the large swings in precipitation of the UK that are associated with the very negative NEO, for example, in 2010. 
and we recover some of the scale. So we have another correlation of 0.38 between um, our downscale precipitation, uh, forecast precipitation, and what actually happened. So there's another question here. So we kind of, okay, so maybe we're able to say something, some modest scale about, um, seasonal time scales about how precipitation might evolve over the UK. But then we've got to ask the further question, which we haven't addressed yet, is whether that's actually a useful scale. So can people make, uh, can that actually inform a complex decision that a water resource manager would have to make? Okay, and the other sort of research question that we're thinking about um, in impetus is thinking about even a longer time scale. So we're going, going beyond seasonal to thinking about uh, annual or interannual predictions. Um, again, it's, this, it's the same principle. We use a climate model. Uh, we initialize it with information about the current state of the climate and then run it forward in time. Um, and there are areas where we're sort of seeing some skill um, appear in uh, these uh, longer time scale predictions. Um, this is some results from work that we've been doing at Reading. Um, what we're trying to do is forecast conditions over the North Atlantic, so in what's called the subpolar gyre. So it's basically the, the sea surface temperatures, how warm the, 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 kind of the North Atlantic is to the west of the UK. Um, and there's reasonable skill in terms of forecasting um, sea surface temperatures in that region. Um, so here are some, um, just some indications of starting from different start dates. Um, so the black line here is the observed evolution of sea surface temperatures, just in the North, uh, North Atlantic subpolar gyre. Um, the blue lines are forecasts started in 1965, then 1980 and 1995. And you can sort of see by just eyeballing the, uh, the time series that we're able to capture this rapid cool in, in, the, in our forecast, able to capture the rapid cooling of the subpolar gyre uh, in 1965, the kind of uh, neutral conditions in 1980s, and then again this rapid warming of the subpolar gyre in 1995. And that arises because of this long time scale um, memory in the ocean circulation in the North Atlantic, which the model is able to capture. And if you look at this quantitatively, it kind of suggests that we have appreciable scale in uh, forecasting those sea surface temperatures for sort of two to three, four years um, out uh, from current conditions. Again, there's still sort of fundamental questions here. Okay, so we're forecasting uh, sea surface temperatures over the North Atlantic, but what does that actually translate to in terms of um, scale, in terms of rainfall and temperatures over the UK? And again, you know, uh, is the ready scale in thinking about uh, people making complex decisions around water resource management? Okay, so um, just thinking about some of the other aspects uh, that we're sort of addressing within impetus. So we've been thinking about the meteorological aspects, but we're also thinking about the hydrological aspects. Um, so from the land surface perspective, there's kind of two aspects that we're very keen to, to look at. One is uh, the spring drying of soils um, in uh, meteorological forecast systems. So meteorological forecast systems used by the European Centre for Medium Range Weather Forecasting and the Met Office have quite a complex land surface, uh, land surface model in them. Um, and we're looking at how we can improve uh, parameterizations associated with the spring drying of soils, which we think is an important process for kind of continuing, um, or at, basically producing the antecedent conditions for summer heat waves, um, and in particular kind of focusing on um, parameterizations around plant water stress and so on. The other issue we're thinking about is linking those land surface models with uh, recharge models, um, or recharge models for groundwater models, uh, and in particular thinking about surface heterogeneity, so thinking about these really small scales um, over which uh, deep drainage and recharge occur. CEH are leading the work on river flow modeling. Um, so they're looking at a range of uh, river flow models um, to try and work out which ones might be best suited for thinking about forecasting. Um, there's just a couple of results here from uh, the grid, grid model of uh, the River Tay and the River Ribble, um, sort of showing um, the black line is the observed evolution of uh, river flow, and the red line is the model, the grid-to-grid -grid model. And you can see the model's doing quite a good job. So there's, there's kind of questions here about how good these models are for individual catchments and rivers, and in particular whether these models can capture the, um, the recovery um, of low river flows after droughts, which is a particularly difficult problem for models to do. BGS are looking at... Um, the, uh, the groundwater modeling aspects. Um, and in particular, um, you know, there's a range of, sort of groundwater models that are currently used in some of the operational products that BGS produce in terms of, sort of forecasting. Um, so here's a, a picture from Chris Jackson, who's leading that work, um, just looking at uh, evolution of um, 
basically uh, water levels within the, uh, an aquifer in the Berkshire Downs. And the black line is the observed. And then the grey line, which is difficult to see because it lies basically underneath the black line, um, is from the our groundwater model. So showing that you know, for the, the simpler chalk aquifers, um, this model is doing quite a good job. So the, the, the goal in impetus is to, again, assess a wider range of groundwater models to think about more complex aquifers. Um, and also thinking perhaps about some of the more complex models that BGS have been developing. So in particular, the, the Thames uh, TIM model, um, which has been developed in conjunction with Thames Water. And then finally, uh, there's a water demand component uh, within impetus. Um, so water demand is a huge problem. Um, we kind of felt in impetus that we couldn't address all of it. Um, so we decided to focus on a specific area, um, and that's around uh, water uh, domestic water demand modelling. Um, and this had been led by Ben Anderson at Southampton. Um, and the idea here is to kind of build upon some of the work that Ben and others have been doing um, in the Sustainable Practice Research Group, um, thinking um, about water and water use at a much more local scale. And what Ben's going to be doing is using some of these small-scale um, modelling techniques that he's been developing called micro-simulation techniques to, to look at um, so spatially disaggregating water demand across southeast England um, and then thinking about how water demand might change under drought conditions. And then finally, there's a, um, a, a component around using um, forecasts within um, the real world for complex decision-making um, so uh, there's kind of a range of issues that we kind of feel like, you know, we can address. So, you know, uh, it's, it's fine producing forecasts of precipitation temperature, but, you know, we, we need to do more on thinking about bridging the gap between what we produce and what people actually need in terms of metrics. Um, there's another issue, which I guess links into some of the issues that have been raised in Marius. Um, seasonal forecasts are all probabilistic, so we produce probabilistic information and not deterministic information. So there's, we produce information about risks, rather than uh, uh, you know, a deterministic forecast about exactly what's going to happen. Uh, and the kind of real questions are there about how, how those probabilities should be used to inform complex decisions. And then finally, there's, a, there's an issue around, you know, well, maybe we can produce the perfect forecast, um, but would anybody actually use it? Um, and so there's a whole range of issues um, which are you know, much more around understanding the wider kind of constraints for um, people who are making complex decisions to actually, uh, actually use uh, drought forecasts. Okay, so just to bring it to a close, um, so uh, I've kind of run through a couple of things. The first is kind of, you know, we're kind of at this interesting point, really, in terms of uh, seasonal forecasting uh, of, uh, of meteorological conditions for drought, in that the, the, there's some modest skill um, for large-scale circulation patterns, such as the North Atlantic Oscillation, uh, and it, there's some suggestion that that might produce some... Um, modest skill, again, for, for conditions that might be conducive for drought over the UK. Um, but really, the key question we kind of want to get into is how does this translate into useful skill um, for UK drought forecasts? Um, and also, can this kind of form um, operational projects, such as hydrological outlooks, which is a product that's uh, produced uh, in conjunction with uh, uh, by, the, by the Met Office, the Environment Agency, CEH and BGS. And so perhaps some of the, the ideas we're developing in particular can help kind of... Um, develop hydrological outlooks. Um, and then there's you know, kind of the fundamental question about using these forecasts to inform complex decision-making. And I'll draw it to a close there. Thanks very much.